All right, guys. Hey, welcome back to the Resilient Show. Uh, I- I'm super pumped. I got one of the guys that I watch all the time on the show today, uh, Nick Freitas. Um, Nick has uh, got a crazy bio, but before we get started, I want to want to point out our backdrop here. If you have not seen our backdrops on the Resilient Show, for every guest we do a custom one, and Nick's a state rep in Virginia, and so we got the state uh, of Virginia being represented today, and uh, our, our team always does a real good job of that. Nick, before we get started, I want to re- read your bio so everybody, I think a lot of our audience probably knows who you are, mm-hmm. which won't go right into reading your bio for those that don't. Nick Freitas is a member of the Virginia House of Delegates representing the 62nd District. Uh, prior to being elected, Nick served in the United States Army with the 82nd Airborne. Uh, after 9-11, you made the decision to become a Special Forces Green Beret, which is awesome, uh, and where you served later on two tours to Iraq with 1st Special Forces Group. As a state rep, you currently serve on Virginia's Committee of Education, Finance, Communications, and Technology and Innovation. You're the host of Making the Argument podcast, and nearly every morning you tune in to over 1.2 million people who follow you on Instagram, me included, uh, to share your your a little uh, morning coffee, daily truth, and some of your witty humor, which I love and my family loves. It's something I, I definitely enjoy. Most importantly, though, you're an outspoken Christian, and you speak uh, openly about your faith and about your roles as a husband and, and a father, and we're going to get into some of that. So welcome to the show. No, no, thank you. It's an, it is truly an honor to be here. Yeah, well, uh, I know you came, you flew in from to come, so I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we do before we get started on the show is we we have some amazing sponsors uh, for this show. The Resilient Show sponsored by Smith & Wesson Firearms, uh, Vortex Optics, Gators Eyewear, uh, Bio Pro uh, Supplements, and Bio Accelerator, which is a stem cell company out of America, but down the, the clinics down in South America, as well as Allied Wealth Management. And all those sponsors uh, make this show happen, but they also love our guests. So we have some great gifts for you. The only one I'm going to give you here in studio today is some Gators glasses. Oh, thank so, you. <laughs> so here's some Gators glasses. Oh, that's awesome. Know, I think you probably know about Gators, but oh, yeah. it's been around yeah. the military and, and, and I mean, 35 years, an American-made, incredible uh, eyewear. Oh, yeah. No, these are – oh, yeah, look at that. Oh yeah, that's stylish too. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. awesome. I, I love, I love getting. I, most of, the, I think all the companies that I work with, I don't represent anything I won't use, but all yeah. the companies I work with, I've used for years before. Obviously, Smith and Wesson I had Smith and Wesson yeah. as a kid, so it's a huge honor to represent Smith and Wesson. But Gators, man, I I jumped with Gators, shot with Gators, yeah. I wore them overseas. Uh, the stuff we were doing in Ukraine, all the, I mean, I had all the guys wearing them because of the ballistic lenses. I just yeah. trust the ballistic lenses. Yeah, and making sure everybody had Gators on. That translucent lenses, so we can mm-hmm. wear them twenty four seven. Yeah, uh, but uh, Smith and Wesson wants to hook you up with a firearm. Oh, okay. I'll so, take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get you a uh, your choice of of a pistol. I think you said you wanted a pistol. Oh, and then we're gonna, and then we're gonna uh, so you go on Smith and Wesson's website, pick out what you want, as well as Vortex Optics. Uh, man, oh, I don't know gosh. if you ever shot Vortex. Optics. I haven't shot Vortex. Vortex no. is amazing, and they just got a contract with the U.S. military, so they're oh really? Yeah, they're they're putting them on it, and and. Uh, a lot of our special operators use them, and some of the soft units. Brit- British just got Britain just signed a contract with them. Oh, nice! So they, got, they got some incredible optics, and then um, Bio Pro. I don't know if you've heard of Bio Pro, but uh, Bio- from watching you, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> Bio- so you got to try it. So uh, it works. I, I, I don't have any here with me, and I, and I apologize to Bio Bio Pro for not having it. But I'm going to get some mailed out to you. I, I love it. It, it. it keeps me sharp, but the, the sleep, man, yeah, is, is so so good. That's that's huge too. Yeah. I can't believe how much sleep has become an important thing, and sometimes. Yeah. Difficult to attain. Well, so. I had several guests that we gave to on the show right back, and and they'd like, hey, can I get some more of that? Because yeah. I never saw, um, uh, Eddie Gallagher, Mark Green, yeah. a couple of guys that wrote back and said, man, like they, it was it really helped their sleep. They were struggling with sleep. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is Bio Accelerator. We we're talking about it a little bit before the show, mm-hmm. but if you if your body's hurting, yeah, and you got some things to heal up, <laughs> man, I, I would take them up on the offer to go down to Columbia. Spend a weekend in, in Medellin, which is an awesome place. Yeah, and uh, and and get hooked up with the stem cell treatment down there. Well, gosh, if you're gonna force me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, it, <laughs> it's worth the vacation, and you will gotta, walk away feeling absolutely amazing. I gotta, t- I gotta up my gift game, man. This is incredible. No, I no, appreciate it. It makes me look good, but yeah. it's not me. <laughs> yeah, I say it's Christmas morning every morning on yeah. uh, every sh- yeah. for every show. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we'll we'll get you hooked up with all that. I want to talk about a, uh, several things. I want to talk about male leadership in, in our culture and in, in, within our communities because uh, I just feel like you're the right guy to talk about that. I've actually been holding off to talk to some of the guests about that, uh, knowing you're coming on because I just feel like you're the right guy to talk about that. 
the state of our nation, which <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we could do a couple of hours on the state yeah, of our nation. Those, those two things are connected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they're very connected. Yeah. yeah. The, the American education system. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about our second amendment and why it's under attack. And, and of course we, we can't at this point right now, I can't have someone like you on and not talk about the 2024 election. So we got to talk <laughs> yeah. about the election. Yeah. Uh, but but I want to start, before we get into all that, I want to start off with, to me, like looking at you, like the all-American dad, husband, father, you're like a really good model of what, what an American man should be. And I've heard this, I heard, I was talking to someone and they're like, uh, this lady, and I told her I was going to be interviewing you. This is well, the trip I was just on. And she's like, I wish my dad was like, like Nick. Oh, that's, that's what she said. Uh, she wished she could have grew uh. up with a dad like you. How, like, how did someone become, you know, how'd you grow up? Like, where'd you, where'd you grow up? I know you don't want to talk about where you grew up, but <laughs> where'd you grow up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how'd you, how'd you grow up? And what were your parents like? Um, so I, I, I grew up in California, mm -hmm. um, which is a beautiful place, just horribly, horribly run. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I, I grew up, my mom was actually going to Biola, uh, which is the Bible college of Los Angeles in Southern California. Yeah. She was studying to be a nurse. She'd actually just got a, uh, a, um, an offer to go down to Columbia, uh, cause she was also a Spanish speaker. So she was going to do part of her nursing school in Columbia, um, as part of also her, her, her Spanish language training as well. And uh, she found out she was pregnant with me. And uh, her and my dad were not married at the time. I was, I was definitely not a part of the, uh, I was definitely not a part of their plan at that point. And, um, and there were people in my mom's life because again, she was going to a Bible college in LA. You can't be pregnant going to a Bible college in LA at that particular time, um, or at least it was problematic. We'll put it that way. Yeah. And so she did have people close to her that was like, well, you know, there's a, uh, it's an easy, easy solution to this. And uh, that was completely unacceptable for my mom. And then her and my dad ended up getting married. Uh, I didn't actually know this story until I was 16. And the only reason I found out about it was because I was, I was going through my grandpa's den and I was looking at an old wedding invitation for my dad and mom. And they got married in February and I got I was born in August and I started doing the math. I remember looking at my grandfather going, am I premature? And he goes, why do you ask me that? <laughs> and I told him and get a call from my dad. Hey, I understand you just found out. Um, my mom and dad uh, had me and my brother. Uh, my mom and dad got divorced shortly after that. My dad lived down in Southern California. My mom moved back up to Northern California. And so I would spend the school year with my mom, the summers with my dad. That's how I grew up. But I, I, I always say my mom got remarried and then uh, her and my stepdad got divorced. And then my Dad got remarried, had seven more kids. Uh, so I have another seven, seven brothers and sisters. Yeah, I'm the oldest of nine. <laughs> my youngest brother is younger than my oldest daughter. So my daughter has an uncle that's younger than she is. That's when I told my dad, I was like, hey, it's going to start getting weird here, dad. You're going yeah. <laughs> like, to hang up the spurs. But um, unfortunately, my dad and my stepmom are also uh, going through a divorce now too. So, And then my wife's family was somewhat similar. Her parents had uh, gotten divorced and uh, remarried. They all stayed together though. And her stepdad, wonderful, wonderful guy. So my wife and I both grew up in kind of somewhat tumultuous. I, I don't, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, broken family. It was, right. you know, because I didn't feel that. I, I felt love from my dad. I felt love from my, you know, mom. I, I uh, it wasn't ideal. Right. But that was kind of the, that was the environments that both my wife and I grew up in. And then uh, my wife and I started dating in high school. I went off to the military and we got married less than a year out of high school. So that was kind of the environment. My grandparents actually were hugely important in my life growing up. How, how long has it been now? You guys? We've been married 25 right? years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We've been married 25 years now. So yeah, three kids. And my oldest daughter's 21, just got married to a yeah. great guy. And then my son's 18, about to go off to the military and my youngest daughter's 16. So one of the things that was really formative to me growing up was the amount of time I got with my grandparents. You know, when my dad couldn't be there, which was often obviously for obvious reasons, my grandparents, my grandfather's really stepped in and I think filled, you know, part of that role. But yeah, I, I always say it, it might not have been the ideal situation growing up, but I always felt Love and to this day, I have a great relationship with with my dad and my mom. How old were you when you joined the military? Right out of high school. Right out of high school. Two weeks out of high school, I was on the bus going to Fort Benning, <laughs> beautiful Fort Benning, yeah. Georgia, for infantry basic training at Airborne School. I, I got to tell a story real quick. Yeah, yeah. So right before I left, um, my wife and I had, like we'd known each other since freshman year of high school. And the moment I saw her, I could I could take you back to the desk I was sitting in, in the classroom I was sitting when she walked in the door because I remember thinking two things: oh my gosh, she's gorgeous, and that's never going to happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, and I was right for the first three years of high school, but this yeah. for senior year for some for some reason, right? She uh, 
I don't know. Uh, maybe it was because we had a graduating class of 27 and our yeah. options were incredibly yeah. limited. <laughs> but um, right before we left for basic, I was so sure because I'd heard all the stories of people going off to basic. I was like, there's no way this smoking hot girl is going to stay with me when I'm gone for, you know, three yeah. months going off to basic. And I remember telling her before I left, I said, look, I'm clearly not going to be dating anybody in Fort Benning, Georgia yeah. for basic and airborne. But uh, if you want to, you can. Mm-hmm. And she she was really mad that I even said that. I even said that to her, but I was determined. Like I wasn't going to get hurt. I wasn't, this wasn't going to happen to me. And, uh, I get down there. I get to make a call to her when I'm first in processing at 30th AG and you love, or I didn't say, I love you. Um, just, you know, talk about how much I missed her. She said the same thing. And then we went up to basic and for like two weeks, no letters, no nothing. All, every once in a while, one would trickle in for one of the other guys. And I'm like, all right, that's what I thought. Yeah. And then, uh, week three, all the mail stuff had got worked out. And I got a letter for every day I had been gone. And all the way through, she wrote me a letter every single day I was in basic training. And she flew out for graduation. We were right there on the Chattahoochee River. And that was the first time I told her I loved her. And uh, gosh, about six months later, we were married. Heck yeah. 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 Still married. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and three? Three kids. Three kids. Yeah. Uh, girl boy so girl. she's so she's seen the journey of well that that had to be a big commitment because after 9 11 happens right you're you're at 82nd airborne 9 11 happens and you make the decision to, to go to the q course right so i was uh, we were actually in the 25th infantry over in hawaii okay so in 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 the i was in the 82nd i volunteered to go to kosovo but in order to do that i had to re-enlist and then go one battalion over because first of the 325 was in kosovo second okay. wasn't going and um my sergeant major got pissed at me because they had sent me to ranger school and sniper school. Like, you're not going to re-enlist to go one battalion over. I'm like, well, they're the ones going to Kosovo. And that was the closest thing to war at the time. And uh, he's like, I'm not letting you go over there. I want to prove it. And I didn't know any better. I probably could have done it anyway. Yeah. But um, I said, fine, I'll re-enlist and I'll go somewhere completely different. And uh, actually, at the time I told Tina, I came home. I'm like, they're not going to let me go. I'm, I'm tired of, I don't like peacetime army. I'm getting out. I'm going to go be a cop. My dad was LAPD. I'm like, I'm going to go be LAPD. And she goes, well, we really hadn't planned to do any of that. She goes, what if you re-enlist one more time and we just pick a place that we really want to go? I said, fine, you want to go to Italy or Hawaii? She goes, Hawaii. She loves the beach, loves yeah. the, Hawaii. We'll go to, great, boom, re-enlisted, Hawaii. We get over to my unit in Hawaii. That was in June of 2001. Shortly after. September 11th happens. And I remember we were in the field and we come back and I looked at Tina and I said, I know what I'm doing for the next 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I said, I said, if we don't deploy within six months, I'm going to volunteer for SF. That's what I was saying. That's, that's a big decision with yeah. a wife and a, and a, you had a kid yet at the time? Uh, she was pregnant with our first. Yeah. It's a good, yeah. or got course. pregnant with our first when we were there. Yeah. It's, it's a long, you know, the, like all special forces, it's a long pipeline. You, yeah. you weapon sergeant. So yeah. you're like at least a year, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. a little over a year with language at that time. I think it's a little bit lower, less now, but it was over a year for yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Tons of uh, Navy SEAL guests. We yeah. hear all about buds. Yeah, I rarely get to ask people about the Q course. Uh, so a lot, a lot of the listeners hadn't heard much about the Q course. Yeah, the, the Q so, course is a, kind of a different environment. Um, so I, I was going into the Q course within, uh, and, and for those who know, the Special Forces Qualification course, it's it's uh, predominantly at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Camp McCall, which is kind of close by. Um, what makes special forces or green berets different from the rest of the special ops community is that focus on unconventional warfare and counterinsurgency. So we have like seven core missions. A lot of guys have missions for special reconnaissance. A lot of guys have mission for counterterrorism, but that, 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 that FID mission, that, is that foreign what? internal defense. Yeah. Um, but then the, the coin and the, the UW, the UW is really the unconventional warfare component. And, and the way I've described it to people before is special forces is not John Rambo. Special Forces is Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. When it's when it's done correctly, especially that UW piece, it is a 12-man ODA that goes out there, links up with indigenous forces, and you're either fighting to overthrow the current government or you're working with host nation forces to beat an insurgency. But everything that you're doing is by, through, and with the local population. So probably like the, uh, the, the biggest thing in the Q course, because... Um, no matter where you go, you're going to go through some version of small unit tactics, right? And I'd already been through ranger school, so small unit tactics was kind of a, a different version of that with NSF. The thing that is so unique about it is what they used to call, and I think they still Robin Sage. Mm-hmm. And that is, at that time, it was the largest unconventional warfare exercise uh, that's conducted in the world. And they take a huge part of North Carolina, and it essentially becomes a foreign country. It becomes Pineland. 
And when I say it becomes a foreign country, what I mean is, is when you go into certain of these little rural towns out in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, and you turn on the radio, you'll hear Radio Pineland. Um, and you, you're given an indige force that you've got to work with and Pineland's got a whole history and, and they've got their wars and you've got to understand the geopolitics of the situation and you're, you're training your indige fighters and you've got to manage the politics internal with this rebel group and that rebel group with other rebel groups and the mistrust they have for us forces, because we can't be relied upon to, you know, <laughs> you know, they, they read our history as well. Yeah. And, uh, they and you, abandoned allies. Oh yeah. Yeah, they <laughs> yeah. do. You, you will, they will get very specific on yeah. instances where Americans have been, and why should they trust you? And, yeah. and a lot of it is out of the box thinking on, on how do I get somebody that is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily like me, but we have a common enemy and we have an objective and we have to find a way to, to meet that objective. And so how do you find common interests, common cause in order to do that? And then how do you work within the resources that you have? That was an incredible experience. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot through that about properly understanding that, look, not everybody sees the world the way you see it. That doesn't mean you can't work together. It doesn't mean you can't understand the perspective. And probably the major takeaway that they just hammered home um, every single day was understand your operational environment. So that that was that was the Q course. And, and the agreement there with Tino was, I said, I want to go SF. And, you know, we're watching daily reports of, yeah. you know, SF and Afghanistan and everything else that's going on. And, and I said, look, you're letting me go SF. I'll let you pick the group. Mm -hmm. And she goes, which group is closest to home? Like first group. Like, all right, I want you to, I said, I can't promise you that. They're going to send me where they you need, but I will, I will request first group. And yeah. uh, that's what I ended up getting. And we up in Fort Lewis, Washington. Thank God they yeah. didn't send me to Okinawa. She would have been furious. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so she was, she was a great sport, but that's how that, uh, that's how that went down. And for those who don't know us, Second half of the training or last part of the training really is you, you get your language, language training, go DLI. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we don't, they have an in-house language training now. Okay. So they do send some guys out to DLI in, in, in Monterey, California, but um, they have it in-house. It, okay. It's all Fort Bragg. That was, you know my, that. my wife was not a huge fan of uh, what we affectionately call Vietnam, North Carolina, because <laughs> she had been there when they were in the 82nd. She was not eager to go back for the Q course. But um, yeah, you do six months of, uh, most most of us do six months of language training. Mine was Thai. Yeah, so what you cop, kunsabayri ru, pompintan ropi said. And uh, and I've just spoke all the Thai, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, funny. Yeah. I, I, same thing with me. I, I, I know more Dari from being in Afghanistan. I know Urdu, which was, Urdu was my language. Oh, yeah. And uh, But when I learned Urdu and I, I'm with the Pakistan. No one, everyone that speaks Urdu, even though it's a national language, speaks English as well. So yeah. they'd rather speak English with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it was it was it was a great experience, and and first group was a was a great experience. I love uh, love serving with those guys. Love the mission set. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of rain. A lot of, a lot of training and cold, cold wet environment there. It was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I we so when when SF when we're not overseas doing operations or we're training, we're all we will do. Um, training missions with U.S. allies. So when I'm, if, if I'm not in Iraq, I'm in Korea training Korean special operations, or I'm in Bangladesh training Bangladeshi border guards and stuff right. like that. And so, yeah, I, I got to, I got to, I know what the monsoon season is like in, uh, in Bangladesh. And I know what, I know what winter's like in Korea. And, uh, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> so, um, you got to deploy twice to Iraq. Uh, yeah. what, what was, what was the, what was it like in Iraq as a, as a, in ODA? It was, um, we were doing a counterinsurgency mission there. So obviously at that stage, um, a lot of what got me to want to go SF was watching the initial invasion of Afghanistan and watching right. you know, the horse soldiers and triple nickel with fifth group and whatnot. Um, that was the unconventional warfare mission. I was doing the counterinsurgency mission, which is working with the newly established Iraqi government to defeat, you know, Al Qaeda and, and other, you know, uh, Sunni and Shia backed militias. It, it was a good mission. What became very, very frustrating to me because I was there in 06 and 08. 08, I felt like we got a lot more done. Yeah. 06, we went over there and we we, we were operating around Beji, Iraq, um, which is where one of the largest oil refineries uh, is at. So we trained up an Iraqi scout platoon and we would do, go do combat operations. And a lot of what we were relying on was human. Back in 2008, we had a lot more assets available. And so we had, I think the entire military had learned a lot more about how to stack various intel assets in order to get better. Um, so I, I would say like our, our dry hole figure in 06 was like maybe 60, 70%. In 2008, it was more like 20, you know, yeah. 10, 15. Like it, we were, we were a lot more likely if we rolled outside the wire, we were getting our guy. And that yeah. just made for a, a much better tour. Sure. Yeah. Um, it was also interesting because we moved into that transition in 2008 where you had to have a warrant. 
So you really felt like you were operating more like a police force. And yeah. uh, I remember I had my dad fly up from California when I was stationed in Washington and the ODA came over and, and my dad ran us through kind of a, a process on how do you do, we couldn't do interrogations. Was, it, could, was this as a result of Obama, President Obama come in? in he office? hadn't come in yet in, in 08. It, it was more of trying to, and I, and I understood it. Right. This part was, we wanted the Iraqis to take responsibility for mm -hmm. running their own country. We wanted to kind of differentiate between, okay, what is a law enforcement complaint? What is a military complaint? How do we process through a newly established legal system? Um, so I, I understood all of that. Okay, yeah, and, so it's more more of them, Iraq setting up this system to go get bad guys in yeah. a law enforcement type capacity. Yeah, and, and, and it's frustrating to an operator that just wants to go out and operate. But if you're doing SF mission and you understand this is about building host nation capacity, then you find you find the good, good in it. Like now, if I have an... I, because if I had to get approval to do all these other things before and, and some JAG officer decided to say no, and I can't do it, or some battle space owner said, no, you can't do it. Well, now I'm like, I have a warrant from the criminal court of Iraq, right? <laughs> Step aside. This is their country, right? Yeah. And I'm the guy that's rolling with them. So it, it, you you could find a lot of freedom in that if you did it right. Yeah. Um, but then you also learn the process of like, I had to not, I had to take witnesses down to the central criminal court of Iraq in order to give testimony to a judge. Um, so there's just different things that you ended up learning that were interesting and, but the politics did start to come into play more where it was a lot harder to get outside the wire. I remember one time we had, we had probably 10 different sworn statements, uh, on this guy that we, we rolled and picked up and we had to take him over and drop him off. This is, this is 08. We had to drop him off to the conventional brigade that we were working with. And in order to keep them in their, um, detention center, we had, I had to go before the judge advocate general. Like they, it was almost like you had the XO or the operations officer for the brigade. And then I almost have like a prosecuting attorney and a defense attorney. And that was a little weird because I'm, I'm a sergeant first class and I carried this, I did it as kind of a joke. I had this full cardboard cut out of John Wayne from the Green Berets. <laughs> and I kept having to go over to these brigade staff meetings. I'm the lowest ranking guy there. So I show up to one of these things and I pull out John Wayne and I set him up right next to me. And they're like, Sergeant so Freitas, what the hell is that? I'm like, oh, just got tired of getting outranked by all you guys, so brought the Duke with me. John Wayne ever pretend to be one of you guys? No? All right, then. <laughs> and so they put up with me. But, um, but I'm sitting there, and I got this guy. We got this bad guy, two of them. Right. As I'm laying out, and I've been up for 48 hours at this point because we went through you know, multiple houses, got our guys, come back, fingerprinting, medical examination, you know, battlefield interviews, like all that stuff. And I, I've been up for 48 hours straight between planning, operations, and, and recover, the, recovering them. And so I'm exhausted. And I'm a smart ass. Yeah. And an exhausted smart ass can be a little bit flippant, especially when you're used to operating in an environment where we don't take rake quite as seriously. <laughs> And so this, this JAG officer, she's sitting down and she goes, I don't think you should go to higher detention. Now, again, I, I just went out there, the ODA risked our lives. The, the Iraqi scouts were, risked their lives. The witnesses that gave us this testimony risked their lives. And now we're just going to let this dude out because you don't, you don't think you should go to higher detention? Pray tell. And she goes, um, she goes, well, I don't think you have sufficient evidence. I said, I have 10 sworn statements from 10 independent Iraqis that, that say, she goes, I, I said, is it, is it just me or, or Iraq, are eyewitness statements no longer sufficient evidence? She goes, well, it would be better if you, if you had DNA evidence. I'm like, oh ma'am, I'm so sorry. I left my CSI Baghdad <laughs> kid at home. I didn't bring that. And at this time the, the ops officer is not like, sorry, I'm afraid. I'm like, withdrawn. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, what do you want me to say? She, she was binge watching a CSI oh, over there. Right. And, and she goes, <laughs> she goes, well, I think they're picking on him. You, I'm sorry. You think people came to give me sworn testimony to go into their neighborhood and get this guy out and they're just picking on him. Well, I, it's because he's, he's homosexual. And like I said, do you have DNA evidence of that? <laughs> <laughs> Ops officer, sorry, I'm afraid of, sorry. Like, and, um, but we're going through this whole process. I'm like, this is, I said, I don't know what we're supposed to do as far as conducting operations to keep people safe. If when Iraqi civilians come in and say, these two guys have conducted these operations, they're bad guys. We really need them out of our neighborhood. And then we go and get them. Then we bring them into detention. If you let them back out, understand something. Somebody's probably going to die because they know somebody talked and they already have an idea of who that might be. And people are going to start turning on each other. We're going to lose our source network within this particular area. And I'm going to start to question why the hell we're risking our lives doing anything if this is all it takes to release somebody. 
they ended up going to higher detention. But that was a very eye-opening moment for me on what exactly are we doing here? Yeah. And, and why would this be your decision? Shouldn't this be the Iraqi court system's decision? Why are we intervening at that level? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the difficulty with conducting operate 2008 was kind of a pivotal moment for me because I had been in 11 years active duty and, um, and I, and I had some really good opportunities coming up. I had got to go to Sephardic, which is kind of like our yeah. high speed, you know, CQB school. So at, at this point I, I'd been in 18 Bravo, I'd been 18 Fox. Um, I was one of the senior guys on the team. There's weapons and comms, right? Intel. Yeah, weapons Intel. and Intel. Okay. So I got to do the Intel piece, which I really liked. And, um, and my next stop was either, my next stop was probably going to be to go to Oki and either be on the SIF uh, or what they used to call the commanders and extremist force. Um, and then I was going to be a team can, can, can you tell everybody what that is? Cause they, the, the, the ODAs is like what yeah. traditional Green Berets are at ODAs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a SIF team yeah. is an ODA, but it's an ODA with a very focused mission mission. And the, the way to think of it is a, a SIF team, ideally, some, some are not, but ideally they're forward located. So for first group, that was Okinawa for... 10th group, that would have been Germany for, you know, 7th group, that would have been, I think, somewhere in South America. I'm not sure. Um, so you're forward deployed. And part of that whole process is that you are one of the premier forward deployed, like hostage rescue, CQB forces that you can be utilized and work with host nation elements. So it was, it, it was, a, it was definitely a considered a prestigious position. Not to say I would have gotten that, but you had you you go to Sephardic. That's usually you're either going from there or you're going to Sephardic to go to there. So I would have had a good shot. Um, and I remember I had a conversation with my sergeant major at the time, uh, Jerry, who was a great guy, great sergeant major. Um, and he was the guy that always he always wanted to put us on the enemy. He always wanted to put us on the enemy and do our job. And it was always. And I told him I said, I think I'm I think I'm getting out. He was why I said, Look, I, I love my wife. I love my kids. You know my. I was there for my daughter's birth, my youngest daughter's birth, but I missed her first everything, Christmas, you know, thing, thing. and and look, the guys missed a whole lot more than I ended up missing. But I looked at him and I said, you know, it is one thing. I said, my family gets it. I said, my wife is wonderful. She gets it. Um, and she sees this, the whole family serving, not just me. But if you're going to ask me to go over there and miss all of this stuff and then not be allowed to do my mission, I'm not doing that. Right. You get one or the other. I I get to do my mission. My family will continue to serve. I don't get to do my mission. I'm going to go find some other way to serve my country because this is ridiculous. I've heard that for so many, so many guys. And that's, that yeah. saddens me because I love our country. I love our military. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so many great guys, especially in the special operations community, all this training, and they just want to do their job mm -hmm. and uh, politics and, you know, leadership. That's usually not, uh, it comes down from outside, of, outside of uniform leadership pushes them oh, down yeah. and, yeah. and, and uh, keeps guys from doing their job. And, and they, Morale goes down and they they leave. Yeah, they go to something else. Well, and then they don't have your back when it looks when it looks bad. And yeah, yeah, yeah. man. Just hearing you talk, how, how different uh, Iraq and Afghanistan is. And mm -hmm. I think of uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking of so many service members that that were going back and forth between. Uh, you just did just Iraq. I did just Afghanistan. But I have so many friends that were going back and forth, and the environments were just so different. Yeah. Uh, and how difficult it is it is for our service members that did that. Yeah. So what was your what was your transition like coming out? You you made the decision to get out. Yeah. What what how'd you transition? A lot so, of guys transition's tough for a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I think um this is the part where I have to give my wife Tina just an incredible amount of credit because I didn't deal with a fraction of the stuff that I saw a lot of other guys deal with, and that was because of my wife. Right. Tina really again, when I say she really embraced the role of I'm married to a soldier. Uh, and I'm married to a soldier in wartime. I got to tell you this quick story. There, I, I forget what the movie was, but it was some romantic movie or whatnot. But um, I can't remember what it was called. But the guy, the guy's in the military. He's dating this girl. She loves him. He loves her, the whole deal. And she just can't, you know, handle him being gone. And so she kind of, my wife ended up writing like a blog on it being like, this is crap. Like she went on like Facebook <laughs> or something. She goes, this is absolute crap. If you don't have, if you don't have what it takes to love that man when he goes and does his job, you're the problem, not him. You're the problem, not the mission. And she took that very seriously. She's like, no, she goes, this is, this is me and my husband ride or die forever, right? God brought us together. And nobody, nobody's taking us apart. She translated that to my kids too. So it would have been very easy for my wife to be like, I didn't sign up for you being gone half the time when we're, when we're married at a minimum. Right. 
And she could have become bitter and, and a lot of people would have understood it. And that bitterness could have transferred to my children. My dad's never here. Why is daddy never here? You know, but it wasn't, man. When I was gone, she made little t-shirts with pictures of me on them for my kids. Like she would, you know, daddy's over there protecting us. Daddy's over there fighting for us and keeping us safe. And, um, and say whatever you want about U.S. foreign policy, because I got plenty of critiques of U.S. foreign sure. policy. The bottom line was, is she wasn't over there. She wasn't there supporting U.S. foreign policy. She was there supporting her husband and the guys that I was fighting alongside with. Yeah. And uh, and so when I got home, my kids were happy to see me. My wife was happy to see me. Um, and that made a huge difference. And when it when it came time to transfer out of the military, there was a lot of questions on what we were going to do because this is all we had known as a married couple. It's all our family had known. And I didn't know what I was going to do in the private sector. And I ended up working for a great guy named Bruce Parkman, uh, who had a company called NEK. Came right out. I started working for him. I heard you say that earlier. What's NEK stand for? <laughs> yeah. So the funny Put story behind this, the funny story behind it, it's not an acronym for anything. Okay. His whole thing was, he was a former seventh group uh, sergeant okay. major. And he get out and he's like, I want a company. I goes, I don't want to work with pencil necks. I want neck breakers. And so NEK, not even spelled neck, right? Yeah. <laughs> became the, so that's like neck. the lore. <laughs> that was the lore of NEK. But uh, Bruce, Bruce is, Bruce is a, a, a great guy. And um, so I ended up working there for seven years. And um, during that seven-year period, um, worked with a lot of great people, a lot of former SF, a lot of former military guys. At some point during that, I got asked if I would run for Virginia House of Delegates out in Virginia. And the first answer I gave, which was the smart one, was no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but two years later, I got asked again, and I did. And I remember telling Bruce, I'm like, hey, I'm not sure how conducive. He's like, I support you, man. You know, we'll, we'll make it work. I'm like, boss, I know the vision you got for this and where you want to go with it. And the bottom line is I'm not going to be able to split between the two things very well. And, and the thing is, in Virginia, House of Delegates is not a full-time job. It's not a full-time salary. You get $17,600 a year. Like, it's not meant to be. Uh, so I still had to work, but I knew it wasn't going to sync up with what he kind of wanted done. Right. And I knew I couldn't give him everything that he needed. And so we we parted. We're still friends. Yeah. Um, I, I got nothing but good things to say about Bruce. But um, yeah. Same here in Texas. I think Texas, you... Uh, I forget what they pay, but it's, it's minimal. Salary. There's only four. Job. There's only four state legislatures in the country that are full time. Okay, and believe me, you don't want it. You don't yeah. want it. Texas actually is, only meets once every two years. Yeah. state leg I love that. Oh my gosh, I love that. But yep. yeah. So, anyways, that um, so I transitioned into that work for there. So I was still working with military guys. I will say this: I had a the first company I was managing a training program because we had a software company based out of Silicon Valley that was making designing analytical software and they wanted to bring, they wanted to get into the special operations space. And somewhere along the lines, they kind of learned that, all right, if we want to break into this space, we need special operations guys. And I was working them for a while and we first came in and they, they were great. It was weird though. I walk into the building the first time and guys are like rolling around on scooters and they're <laughs> like, hey, this masseuse comes on Tuesday and dry cleaning's Thursday. And oh, by the way, in that we get catered three times a day and You'd walk, I walked into this room that looked like it was a Trader Joe's and everything was free. You just, you know, and I just total culture shock for me. And, and here I am bringing a bunch of operators in to train on this analytical software. And let's just say there was moments where that worked really well. And they all thought we were cool operators and we all knew they were yeah. going to be millionaires at 24, right? Um, there were other times it did not work out so well. <laughs> yeah, Personality <laughs> clash. <laughs> I, I had been leading this, I had been leading this training program for a while. And now I'm out in DC at their, at one of their, their locations out there. And this young guy walks in super smart, super smart guy, computer programmer, but they put him as the, the company's head for that program. So now he's talking to me and he goes, Hey, um, Nick, I've got some new ideas on how I want you to conduct the training. I said, Hey, cool. You know, we can always learn. What, what, what would you like? He goes, well, I thought like maybe what you can do is while you're up there, like talking to the guys, like you have like a ball in your hand, like a tennis ball and you're, you're throwing it at them and they're throwing it back. And that way, you know, that they're paying attention. I said, sweet, sweet, cool idea. Hey, real quick. The next time I throw a tennis ball, right. And I hit a freaking Lieutenant Colonel in the face. Cause he's here to review your program <laughs> to decide whether or not an entire section of special operations <laughs> wants it. When he gets pissed and storms out, do I tell him that this was your ass idea or mine? <laughs> And he, he goes, oh, um, oh, huh, huh. I, didn't, I didn't really think about that. I'm like, dude, come on. Yeah. Like, we, we're happy to do stuff, but that's stupid. Because I'm still in like. Right. 
a part of me clicks because we're used to talking to that yeah, way to each other as yeah. operators. You got a dumb like, idea. I'm going to tell you it's a dumb idea. Oh, right? yeah. Like, yeah. this is ridiculous. And you're, you know, because that's how we used to plan missions. Like, you're going to do what? What do you want? Moron? Mm-hmm. Right. And we didn't take it personal. It's just how we talk to each other. Turns out, corporate world does not talk to each other yeah. that way. And so there was a couple of times where it would be like, um, Nick, I understand that you come from a different environment, but we don't speak to each other that way here. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, hey, to tell them I'm, I'm super sorry. <laughs> but, uh, so, anyway, so I did that. I did that for a while. But uh, and then when the legislature happened, you know, I kind of left yeah. that side of the work. But yeah. Well, you, you're doing pretty, pretty great for yourself now. You get uh, <laughs> with the Instagram and your your podcast, and uh, yeah. really want to just lean in, you know, to some of your perspectives. Uh, America as a whole, when America is divided, and America is definitely divided right now. And, yeah. And what Americans tend to do. Is is to look at Washington D.C. to solve the problem. Look at politicians <laughs> to solve the problem. Which yeah. I, I think you and I both agree. That's even as a as a you know someone who's sitting in office. Uh, I, I think we both agree that that's not the solution. I think real change, the change that we're looking for as Americans in, in our country, comes. It starts in our homes. Yeah. In our in our communities, uh, is in our churches, in our schools, in our states, and then eventually you know that change pr- should spread to Washington, not the yeah. other way around. Uh, furthermore, I believe that that change. Uh, it starts with men, men in the yep. communities. Where do you think America has lost that that reality to where we just stop looking at men in our communities and our family and looking to Washington D.C. to th- solve the problem? There's quite a few. I think there's quite a few answers to that. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna leave the most important one to the end. F- first of all, I, I think I think it's important to understand that the United States is not just a uh, a political organization, right? We're not just a we're not just a, a government system. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I get really pissed when politicians like our democracy, our democracy, our democracy. And I don't just get mad because actually we're a constitutional republic that uses democratic processes, right? right. We can we can argue semantics. I think there's some important ones there, but we can argue that. What I get upset with that is just the point you you made. Mm-hmm. When politicians talk about our democracy all the time, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to think about problems, challenges, opportunities through the lens of our political process. That is not what is unique about the United States. What is unique about the United States is that it was supposed to be established in such a way as to maximize two things, individual liberty and personal responsibility. And those two things have to exist together. If you take away the personal responsibility, well, it's not liberty anymore. It's licentiousness. It means I get to do what I want and somebody else has to pay for it. If you take away the personal, if you take away the um, the liberty with just personal responsibility, well now, okay, great. I'm personally responsible to do what? Vote? I get to pick my political leaders. Does that mean I'm free? I mean, really? If, if freedom is nothing more than I get to vote for politicians every couple of years, then I'm not really free. I get minimal say in essentially who's going to rule me, right? So those two things are absolutely critical. Without them, this country as envisioned and as laid out in that, in that, preamble the Declaration of Independence doesn't exist. It becomes something else. It becomes a, a, a place on the map. It becomes a system of government with a people, but it doesn't, it is not rooted in what that, that vision was. Going to be. Now, a lot of people look at that and be like, well, that sounds great, Nick, but we clearly haven't lived up to it. What about slavery? What about this? What? Yeah, those are horrible. Those are horrible. And the reason why they were horrible is not just because they're immoral. The, re- the other reason why they're horrible is because they were a direct contradiction to what we said we believed about ourselves and about reality when we were established as a country. This is why people like Frederick Douglass would fight against people like William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison, who was a big abolitionist, said, we got to throw out the Constitution. Constitution allows for slavery. It's fundamentally flawed. Frederick Douglass was like, no, the Constitution is understood through the lens of the Declaration of Independence as a liberty document. And what he did was he appealed to Americans to live up to our values, not to change them. Live up to the values that you've articulated. That's the first part that's really critical to understand. Yeah. Because for the last several decades, and it started with the progressive era in the early 20th century. This is none of this is new. Really started hardcore with the the early 20th century. That's where you start to see this, this division on what is America really about? Is it really about individual liberty and personal responsibility. So a small, limited government, which provides a framework for defense from foreign aggression and defense from domestic turmoil, thievery, robbery, murder, rape, et cetera. Is it that, or is it this large government entity, which is now responsible for taking care of us? 
And that's where you start to see this major split taking place between the early progressive era and what you might call a more traditionalist approach to the, the concept of the American dream. And you combine that with what happened during the civil rights movement, because the civil rights movement was a wonderful thing with respect to living up to that original concept of, no, you don't get to deny someone their basic humanity and their basic civil liberties. God-given, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's not some new Christian nationalist concept. God-given rights is enshrined right there in the Declaration of Independence. And, and it, was, it was done so very intentionally because we wanted to set a precedent that you have certain rights as a result of you being a human being. Nothing more is required. They're not grants or privileges given to you by politicians or a government entity. It's something that is, you have it as a part, just by the very nature of your existence, you have certain rights afforded to you and government's role is to protect them. And so the civil rights movement was supposed to be about, yes, we do not deny people rights based off of their skin color. We do not deny people rights based off of their sex, right? which absolutely, right? That's an absolute moral imperative. But then you also saw this, this other element around the 60s, some of whom tried to latch onto the civil rights movement not because I think they were genuinely interested about civil rights, but they were genuinely interested in Marxism. And that's where you get the Frankfurt School out of Germany. That's where you get Herbert Marcuse. That's where you get, you know, um, writings coming into popularity later in, this, in the 70s from Antonio Gramsci, who was a socialist from Italy that talked about the march through the institutions and how for, for Marxism to be successful, you can't just rely on it as an economic theory. You actually have to set up competing institutions or you have to infiltrate institutions and that that's what became known as the long march through the institutions and so what happened was is that you had a very neo-marxist and and again you say this and people are like oh red's oh the commies coming nick no I just go read what herbert marcusa had to say about right. this go read what they don't hide the ball um you know bernadine dorn who was blowing up trying to blow up police officers in courthouses when she got out of jail didn't it stop what she, she went into academia. And so you started to see this increasingly um, significant influence within culturally shaping institutions within the United States. And so over several years, what do you have now? Well, now you have this, this battle going on between, it's not just two worldviews, but fundamentally at some basic level it is, one that says, no, this is what our country is supposed to be. And the other side, which has a fundamentally different view of it, and those two views cannot peacefully coexist. Right. And, yeah. and that's the part that needs to be understood. This is not something that can be solved merely by electing somebody different. Because if, if you have a worldview which says that the United States is fundamentally evil at its core, that means fundamental problems with our system of government. That means fundamental problems with the, the underlying philosophies, all of that. How do I coexist with that? The, I'm willing to let them live out their life the way they want. I'm, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to say, you want to go be a communist? Great. You and a bunch of your friends go buy some property and you can share everything in common. You can run business. You can do whatever you want. You can live out. You can live out your socialist utopian dream right here in the United States without changing anything politically. But that's not good enough for you. No, you, want, our structure. you want to force me to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to do it. Why can't I be free to live the way I want and you're free to live the way you want? Well, they're not willing to accept that. So the reason why I go through this long explanation is because it's important to understand that this is not a simple debate on whether or not we should have one more welfare program or what the top you know, marginal tax rate should be on the income tax. This is about a fundamentally different view for what society should look like. And it is not rooted in John Locke, Adam Smith, Thomas Jefferson, Madison. It's not rooted in that. It is rooted in Marx, Marcuse. You could, ar you could argue postmodernism to some degree. Um, Antonio Gramsci, that's what it's rooted in. The two will not, one will win. I will put it that way. I would like for one to win peacefully because the big question is how did this other one rise to prominence? Like I'm old enough to remember the Berlin wall falling and thinking to myself, well, that socialism's dead. Right. We, we won, they lost. Like it was obvious. Yeah. I mean, that's the question. Like how does, how is even, how is socialism even like a, a consideration in America? At this point, academia, socialists within academia were thrilled when the Soviet Union fell because they reckon they even said this. They recognized it as an opportunity to rebrand socialism outside the specter of the Soviet Union. They could point to the Soviet Union and be like, that wasn't real socialism. That was a perversion. You know, real socialism is this utopian idea. 
you know, real socialism was the beginning days of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela until all of a sudden the country started tanking. Then it was like, well, that's not real socialism either. Right. But if you think about it, socialism actually appeals to people at a very, very basic level, which is this idea that I, I wanna be able to provide, I wanna be able to take care of my family, I wanna be able to do these things. I find it difficult, other people are being successful, I'm not. Clearly there's a problem with the system. So one of the things that it seeks to do initially when it's trying to argue for itself is it takes away your personal responsibility for your, and it puts it onto some sort of enemy that has exploited you or oppressed you, right? Because that's the new dynamic, oppressor and oppressed, oppressed you. And then it promises that if you join this movement and you elect these people, they will get back at your oppressors and they'll liberate you. So that, that's an appealing idea. That's an appealing notion sure. to somebody looking for answers for why their life isn't working. So if those are the two competing philosophies and one of those competing philosophies has become incredibly prevalent in academia, Hollywood, arts and entertainment, the media, and then all of your teachers come from higher ed down. Come from those places. I don't think it's difficult to understand how an idea which started here got to where it is right now and how it's gained an intense popularity. Because every time your kid watches a show, what is that show going to feature any positive male role models? Or is it going to kill off all the male role models that might have been your old heroes? Like right. Luke Skywalker is a washed up, you know, idiot yeah. now who couldn't do anything as good as the Mary Sue who just showed up to replace him, right? Han Solo is a deadbeat dad, right? Yeah. I just, I issue these as some of these examples because they may seem like, oh, really? No, that there is a message that is going through that is Al being Bundy. pushed. <laughs> yeah, Al Bundy, you know? So there's no positive male role models. Your history is bad, right? America is not a force for good in the world, right? That, this is the narrative. You, you can't even be sure of what, what gender you are. Right, so wh what do we have here? We have a massive identity crisis that is going on. Who am I as an individual? Who am I, in? what is my role in place within society? What do I belong to as far as my country or community? If you're being told that everything that you thought was true is a lie, but here's the thing that's gonna make it all better, um, that's, that's problematic. And if you don't have strong fathers, if you don't have strong husbands, if you don't have people that are actually standing up to be good role models, and to push back against those things that are going on within the culture. You don't have any right to be surprised when your children buy into that. It, it, which explains the attack on the nuclear family. Yes, well, Marx hated the nuclear family. Th this needs to be understood. Karl Marx was not shy in saying that the nuclear family is a form of oppression. Like there's a reason why this terminology keeps being used. Mm. This is not me being a conspiracy theorist. They write about it openly. Sure, yeah. Right? They, so they don't hide it. Yeah. yeah, they don't hide it. They're very proud of it when when they when they're talking amongst themselves or when they're writing their literature or when they're teaching their classes. They understand that their presidential candidate doesn't get to come out and say, I hate the nuclear family because it prevents us from reaching a new level of social utopia, right? Right, right. But there's this underlying suspicion that is constantly put forward that, you know, again, men are the source of evil, especially, you know, white Christian men. I mean, you're like the tippy top of the evil pyramid. Um, the nuclear family is oppressive toward women and, and uh, whatnot. Having children is uh, hurting the environment and destroying the planet. Right, like this. Yeah. Is anything I'm saying something you haven't heard coming from somebody that was pretty proud of those ideas? Well, how do you combat that? Well, I'll tell you how hey, you can't. You can't combat it if you don't have strong men that are willing to step up and actually lead their families. You don't have it if you don't have strong women and mothers that are coming alongside and and fighting with them and and insisting on a set of values that they they teach their children. You certainly don't have it if you are handing your children off to a government entity to educate them and then not remaining either diligently involved in that process or choosing an alternative. So I think everything that we're seeing right now is, is very, very predictable when you look at what has transpired over time to take over certain culturally shaping institutions uh, at the same time that they've denigrated the church, denigrated the nuclear family and denigrated the father. One of the things that uh, I've, I've talked a lot about lately is American exceptionalism. Um, mm. You know, I've always believed America to be exceptional. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think is it about America that makes America exceptional? What has made American exceptional is th that two twin concept, individual liberty and personal responsibility. Because, because, because no one else has that. And it, if you, if you look at, we hear the declaration of independence, we hear that, that portion about, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their 
creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hear that and it's rote memorization. Of course, everyone believes that. Nobody believed that in 1776. Right. No other country in the world. I mean, the closest you got was the UK, right? Nobody else believed. We hold these truths to be self that all men are created equal. Yeah. Like, no, they didn't think that. Nobody thought that. That was earth shattering at the time. And then it was this idea that, wait a second, you mean I get to go to a country and, and there's, there's a, a great deal of risk there. It's a new country, right? There, there's a, there's a, a wide open frontier, but it, it can be hostile and dangerous, right? And if I build something, the government doesn't dictate what I build or how I build it or where I build it. The government doesn't come in and regularly confiscate my property. The government doesn't come in and, and regularly terrorize me or force conscript me into the military to go fight foreign wars for, for a, a king. Like you, you're telling me this is a possibility? Yes. That's exceptional. That's exceptional. Okay. There's, there's no, now other countries have started to adopt those same practices, but the, I mean, for, for generations now, but the important thing to understand is that still within the United States, that, that individual liberty with personal responsibility, that wasn't just political freedom. We put so much emphasis on the political freedom. That was also economic freedom. Yeah. And it was, if we're being honest, it was the economic freedom that people were actually seeking the most. For sure. I mean, look, I mean, right now I can own my property, but if I don't pay my taxes on it, oh, yeah. they're going to take it from me. Yeah. So you, you, you don't truly own. It, it is still... By, by comparison within the world, much easier to, you know, own property, start a business, do these things in the United States, but it is becoming progressively more difficult. Right. And the way it becomes progressively more difficult is through more taxation, more regulation, more rules, more restrictions, more executive branch edicts. More government. More government, yeah. right? That's, there it is. So that's what, that is what has made us exceptional, but we are, we are increasingly becoming a, a very, very sad and diminished version of ourselves. Because as uncertainty and chaos works in, people start prioritizing security over liberty. And, and the problem is, is that the more that they seek that sort of security, because it sounds nice, right? What if, sure. Why can't the government just do more to take care of, of us? Here's a good one. Why can't the government just do more to take care of veterans? I, I, w I would caution veterans. Yes. I would caution veterans on allowing politicians to talk you into becoming victims. I'm with you on that, by the way. I'm not a damn victim, <laughs> yeah. right? I knew what I was doing. I was proud to do it. That doesn't mean I've always been proud of my country's foreign policy, mm -hmm. but I was proud of my service, the people I served alongside, and you are not going to purchase that from me by offering me a check as long as I just say I did this, had this, or look to the veterans out there that served, that are struggling with whether it be injuries, PD, you are entitled to the medical care you were promised when you signed that contract to serve your country. But there's a big, big difference from getting what you are entitled to and being talked into accepting a version of yourself that doesn't exist or that is a diminished version of you in exchange for a paycheck. And that concerns me. Yes, yeah, one of been one of my messages. Uh, it, if you get 100% disability and that's what you're you're disabled and you need it, then then get it. That's your issue. You, but if you are not entitled to sit back on your couch and throw your feet up for the rest of your life and be a victim. No. Like that your communities need you. Like yes. Take off the uniform, do something important again. Yeah. Look, I, I think it's, I think it is a travesty that when we look at previous wars, we didn't properly understand things like PTSD. Mm -hmm. But um, can I, can I just say something? The, yeah. the, the key word in PTSD is traumatic. I see people talking about getting money for PTSD who never deployed. Right. What did, what was the traumatic thing that you suffered from? And the answer is they didn't. Right. But there's this idea that, well, you served, so you should be, you served during wartime, so you should be able to avail yourself of this. And I've seen people say, well, yeah, no, the goal is, is to get as much as you can. I'm like, is that really the goal? Is the goal to game the system? I mean, definitely take the benefits you are entitled to by virtue of your service. Do not game the system. To give in the social benefits. Yes. So, yeah. You're participating in the problem. Yeah. And, well, and, and, and it's important to understand there's a lot of people within power that want you to do that. There's a big difference from being entitled and, and feeling entitled. And politicians, please hear me when I say this. There's a lot of politicians that have recognized that there is a great deal of power for them if you feel entitled to something you're not. And you will lose something of yourself if you buy into that. Because it, it, it moves you into this realm now where 
I deserve things I haven't earned. And the only way you're going to be able to get it is by taking things from other people who earned it. And you will lose something of yourself if you buy into that because there are so many politicians that are willing to sell it to you. Coming from some I serve in political office. I see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I want to dig in more into the socialism aspect, but before we do, I want to take a quick break, uh, talk about some of our sponsors. Hey guys, 10 years ago, I had found myself in a position to where you know, investing in Mighty Oaks and, and all the different things I'm involved in, I had found myself not prepared for retirement. And I went to my friend, Ryan Wheelis at Allied Wealth. He had been a longtime supporter of Mighty Oaks Foundation from the beginning. He's one of our first donors to Mighty Oaks, has been a friend for a long time. And uh, I was really trusted him. And he has helped me build my retirement and invest in my future through his company, Ally Wealth. He's one of the smartest guys I know when it comes to wealth management and has taken money that I had stuck away in, in 401ks that was not really producing and made it produce tenfold. And uh, and I'm, I'm so happy with the results for me that I asked him to partner with this show. And he is a partner of this show now. And we want to not only let you guys know about Ally Wealth, but we're going to be doing some special episodes on wealth management with Ryan uh, helping co-host them. I say co-host, I'm going to be asking him questions and, and, and we're going to be providing you information on how to best manage your wealth. So if you're like me and you need someone to help you with your retirement, with your investments, with just your overall wealth management, go to alliedwealth.com and meet Ryan and his team to get you set up. Guys, I'm a lifelong athlete. I've tried all kinds of things from every different diet, from all different supplements, tons of different things to make my body as healthy and as functional as possible. I don't like taking just random supplements off the shelf. It just is either short-lived or just not good for my overall health. So I look for natural things, things that are actually bioavailable to my body. I heard about BioPro years ago from jiu-jitsu athletes, from UFC fighters, and they're all friends of mine who I trust that were telling me, you have to try a BioPro, and, and I did. I, I experienced a tremendous result, mostly in my sleep, to where I was sleeping four or five hours a night, to where I immediately went to sleeping nine hours a night. BioPro has helped my, my recovery, my mental focus. There's a daytime formula, there's a nighttime formula. You could take one or both. I am a believer. I love it, or I would not be promoting it. If you're interested, go to bioproteintech.com and get yours today. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, Nick was, I pulled the string on socialism and it pulled my, it pulled my string of interest too. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I have been so disturbed with the topic of socialism in America and yeah. the fact that our young people have been sold this lie. Uh, so for those who kind of preach socialism and Marxism and mm -hmm. Can you, can you help just really define in yeah. way, define socialism for me? Socialism is advertised as, well, everybody's just equal and everybody has an opportunity to succeed and everyone has access to basic things like food and healthcare and education and housing. Why wouldn't you want everybody to have that? Right? right? Those are, uh, how, how could you not want these things, right? That's how it's advertised. Yeah. That is not what it is. Those are end states. Those are objectives. And guess what? Just about every political philosophy I know of has those same objectives. Sure. How do we, how do people get access to goods and services and everything else? Socialism is a process. It is a method for achieving those things. Now, a lot of people want to try to separate socialism from communism. There isn't any great distinction between the two. Socialism is a, is a theory, a concept, which essentially says that private citizens are not allowed to own the means of production. So you don't get to own a business. You don't get to own a factory. You don't get to own large scale capital equipment. You don't get to own that. The state will own that. Or they would say that the end stage of communism is the people own it. And so it's this idea that every single company, well, no, it'll just be owned by the people. Well, doesn't that sound good? We're gonna decide what to do through democratic processes. Doesn't that sound good, right? This is another reason why there's such an emphasis on democracy, right? As opposed to liberty or ownership. So that's what socialism, the, the process for doing so is imagine a society where no private individual gets to own any sort of productive capacity, right? That's all owned by the people. Now, practically what that means is you need a government big enough and strong enough to confiscate all of the means of production and then give it to the people, which will be run by who? Well, the government, like forget this idea of that. Right. Oh, well, one day in the future, it'll all be owned by just, no, it won't. It's owned by the government. Well, this causes some huge problems from just a practical standpoint on how do you actually do that? Because that's going to require a great deal of violence. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go and confiscate, you know, the, the means of production from everybody that currently owns it and who, by the way, works to earn it. Right. Right. So there's a practical consideration there. The Soviet Union tried to do this. Maoist China tried to do this. What ended up happening? Tens of millions of people died of famine because it turns out, shocker, government bureaucracies are not that good at actually running productive enterprises. 
Yeah. Ever, including ever, the States, right? especially the United States. Ever, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so there's the practical problem is that every time this has been attempted, yeah. what initially happens is the government will come in, they will confiscate a great deal of wealth, they will redistribute it, and people are like, oh my gosh, look, the standard of living went up. This happened in Venezuela for years mm -hmm. because the government ran the oil production right there and oil prices were high. What happened when oil started to drop and all of a sudden they couldn't hand out all the money? Well, you, you get Hugo Chavez walking down the street, right? And there's, there's a camera of him doing this. What company is that? Oh, that is a jewelry store, expropriate. That means the government takes it. What is that? Oh, this is a t expropriate. Right. Well, the government will run it on behalf of the people. Well, the problem money. is, and this is called the so socialist calculation problem. The problem is, is that when an economy is, is not an engine, it's not a government bureaucracy. The economy is people working in voluntary cooperation and competition to provide goods and services mm -hmm. to mutual benefit. Well, when you no longer have that input from private citizens getting to choose that, when the government is now deciding what will be produced and what will not be produced based off of what the bureaucracy has decided, you end up with shortages, you end up with problems, you end up with, if, if you take away all incentive to work hard because you're going to get- Once it's in it, once you take incentive away, yeah. that's where capitalism well, you drives. Don't, you technically don't take away the incentive, you change incentive. Mm -hmm. Incentive within a free market system is- the harder I work providing you goods and services that you want, the wealthier I can become, but I can't force you to buy my goods and services. You can only purchase it voluntarily, which means I have to cater to you. Yeah. So even if I'm a horrible, greedy human being, if the only way I can get what my greed is dictating is by serving you better, that's a positive incentive structure. So what's the incentive structure if the government owns everything? Well, now I got to be as close to the politicians as possible, right? I got to be, I either got to be the bureaucrat, the politician, or I got to be really, really good buddies with them, which means I have to serve the interests of bureaucrats and politicians to get what I want, not customers. You don't right. matter. So that's the practical problem. The moral problem is, is it really justifiable for a group of people to essentially come in and dictate to me what I can do, what I can own, what I can be, what I can invent, what I can purchase? Is that a moral system? When, when I'm no longer, when I'm no longer a free agent within, yeah. within society, I'm essentially a cog in your machine that you've told me is here to bring me equity. And, and then here's the final question on the, on both the morality and the practical side. Okay. Let's say in your mind, you think the socialist utopia where essentially the government will be running all the means of production, right? Let's say you think it's wonderful and let's say it's working out for you, but I just, I just don't agree. And, and I would like to do, I would like to do something else. I, I would like to withdraw from, from that particular part of the system and, and do something else. Am I allowed to do that? Were, were, were people in Mao's China permitted to do that? Were people in the no, Soviet yeah. Union permitted to do that? Were people down in Venezuela permitted to do that? Can you extricate yourself from those rules and regulations where, by which government micromanage? The answer is no. So here's, the, here's the, the one example I like to use that is easy. If you would like to be a full blown, Karl Marx loving communist in the United States of America, there is no law which prevents you from doing so. In fact, if you want to go out and again, start a commune and live on it, not only will I, as a hardcore free market capitalist, not only will I not stop you, I will fight in the legislature to not only protect your right to do that with your own property, I'll try to lower your taxes. I will make it as easy as possible for you to live the way that you would like but you don't get to force anyone to go with you and you don't get to force anybody else to subsidize it. Right? So that's, that's the real, that's the real moral question here. There is nothing in my worldview, which prevents you as a communist from living the way you want within a communist society, but you do not afford the same privilege to me in your society. Right. You require me, you make me a slave to your ideology. I do not do the same to you. So that is the, that is the huge moral quandary. If you took all the practical stuff aside, because every once in a while I hear people say, well, socialism is a good, good idea in theory. No, it sucks in theory too, <laughs> because it fundamentally denies basic human liberty and tries to change it yeah. by turning us into nothing but an economic animal. And as long as I feed you and clothe you and house you, you should be forced to do what I say. Well, there's been other systems that have done that. They weren't called socialism though. It was called something else. Slavery. Yeah. So no, yeah. I'm not going to give in. Yeah. I'm not going to give into this idea that I have to do this for, for your vision because I don't require that of you.
who, who gets so if you take away the incentive from the capitalistic side, who 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 actually gets rich? Who's who gets the wealth? Well, go go it? look at who the wealthiest people are in every socialist society. F Castro's family's doing fine in Cuba. Yeah. Chavez Chavez's family is doing fine. Why everybody else is eating dogs and out of trash cans? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So no. it's it's the government leaders uh, because that's the incentive structure. Who controls the economy? Right. That's why every time, every time in the United States, the government takes a larger piece of the economy. I always look at that and say, <laughs> you, you can, you can claim whatever you want. Let, let's use universal health care as a perfect example of this. Cause people say, oh, well, universal, every other major country has universal health care. Yes. And they also have massive rationing. Canada, Canada through their MAID program, the, the assisted suicide has killed, I think almost 50,000 people. Now keep in mind, Canada only has a population of about 33 million. That's, a, that's an enormous number of people. So why is there such a drive to do that within the Canadian national health system? Well, because as prices go up and you have scarcity, the question is, is are you a customer to the healthcare system or are you a burden on the healthcare system? Yeah. Any program that the government runs, you are not a customer, Amen. you are a burden. In, in the free market, when I walk into a hospital, whether I like it or not, and, and keep in mind, we do not have a free market system within the United States with respect to healthcare. We just don't have a totally government managed one yet. Yeah. When I walk in there, if I'm paying for services, I get treated like a customer. W one of the examples I use of this is for veterans. There's three major benefits that every veteran gets. You get your veteran's mortgage, you get Montgomery GI Bill, and you get your VA hospital. Here's the difference. Every veteran I know loves the mortgage program. Every veteran I know pretty much loves the Montgomery GI program. About 75% of the veterans I know cannot stand the VA. Not because there isn't excellent wings within the VA. And there are some really good people within the VA. The problem is, is that the incentive structure within the VA is when you walk through the doors, you're not a customer, you're a burden. When I fill out my Montgomery GI, all the colleges are competing for me. Why? Because I've got a benefit and I can take it anywhere I want. They're going to make money. Who's going to treat yeah. me the best? Yeah. Right? Same thing with the VA uh, home mortgage. Right? Banks are competing for my... Why? Because they get money. VA is not competing for the money. I don't have an option and they know it. And I know it. So I get what I get. And we can talk all day long about, well, if we do a reform here and reform there, we'll make it better. Mm -hmm. The incentive structure is wrong. And, and that's, that's what it comes down to. So socialism is not just uh, bad in practice. It's bad in theory because it fundamentally denies basic human nature. And then it seeks to make free, otherwise free human beings nothing more than a cog within a, a state apparatus. Uh, I insert my sarcasm here because uh, certainly, it, it certainly... Since someone, so many people are championing it, uh, young people are, are, are cheering for it, now college professors are pushing it, certainly has to be a historical case of success. <laughs> you know what's the one they will point out? <laughs> Catalonia. Okay. So it was, a, it, was a, it was this one little space in Spain, in northern Spain, right around the time of the, the Spanish Civil War. Like, well, well Catalonia was a, a successful communist state. Like, okay, for how long? Yeah. You know, it, like it, it really wasn't, not, not any, but here's, here's the other question. Right. And, and if you want to, if you want to base, I asked this question once to somebody. I said, okay, we, we had a communist system, the, the, the most faithful attempt to carry out Karl Marx versus a hodgepodge of, of relatively free market systems and, and some of them were more free, some of them were less free. Okay, so here's my question. We had a big wall in between them. Who was trying to get where, right? Were all the laborers, were all the workers, you know, workers of the world unite. Are, are they all running down to the south of Florida right now to make makeshift rafts to get to the labor's paradise of Cuba? No. No, we're, are Cubans trying to come here? Yes. Is it rich Cubans? It must be the rich Cubans, right? They're the ones, no, it's poor Cubans. Why would poor Cubans try to get to this hideous, exploitive, capitalistic nightmare that is the United States. You know, why, why was it? Why? Why would people try to leave the workers' paradise of East Germany to make it over to the, the capitalist hellscape of West Germany? Why? Yeah. You know, and so again, wherever it's tried, wherever it's put into practice, the very people socialists claim to want to help are the ones that are trying to leave. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I don't care what your nice sounding argument is. When put into yeah. practice, this is the result every time. And historical evidence shows it over and over and over yeah. again. Yeah. But yet still people are, are led to believe it. And, and, and where, they, where they have targeted people most has been our education system, yes. uh, especially for here in America. I mean, I'd say at universities, but it's, it starts all the way at the bottom. It starts a lot younger now. Yeah, yeah it, it starts it, a lot. This used to be the, in 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 
80s, this was a university problem. It is now a primary school problem. What is the fundamental problem in the in American school system? Incentive structure. Yeah. So I, like, I, I will go back to this every single time. It sounds nice right. to say, well, the government is going to provide X. That way we can ensure that everybody gets it and that there's a certain level of quality and continuity. That sounds nice, right? Like it is hard to argue with that as a concept. Right. The problem is, is what is the incentive structure you've created? When your child goes to a, they call them public schools, but let's be honest, they are government schools, yeah. right? A public park is somebody that anybody in the public can go to. A public school is not for very good reasons, but it's not. Sure. The public school model is also a mass production approach to education. Now you can argue that that's all that they can provide and, and it's out of necessity, fine. It's a one size fits all, right? But it's still a mass production approach to education. The other thing that you have to ask yourself is, okay, well, who sets the rules with respect to curriculum? Ultimately, it's politicians. I love it when people say, I, I you know, I, I get tired of all these conservatives showing up at these school board meetings. We need to get politics out of the out of the school system. Like you can't, because politicians ultimately dictate the funding and they dictate what the curriculum looks like. And they di dictate the policies with respect to who can teach. Now you can say, well, no, 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 there's boards of accreditation that, that said, oh, okay, mm -hmm. who funds it? Politicians. So you're going to get politics within your school system. You're, you're just, that's just going to happen, especially if you make your teachers by law. So like, let's say you're an incredibly gifted teacher. You just understand math and you can teach it very, very well. Does that mean you get to teach in a public school? No, no, you got to go through a credentialing process. Okay. Well, who controls the credentialing process? Well, if it's your university system, well, your university system is, is funded to the tune of a trillion dollars a year between state and federal funding. And then they rely on tuition after that, along with endowments and everything else that they possess. But if you go within the education department of every single major university within the United States, with a few exceptions, you're going to find that the staff and the curriculum is overwhelmingly informed by left-wing ideology. So are, are you shocked when your teachers at your local high school also share the ideology that they were taught for four to six years. You certainly shouldn't. So when you, when you add all of that up, then I, I don't think it's difficult to understand how that's worked its way in and, and what the problem is. So if you want an educational model, then you want one that actually, or if you want an educational model that's going to work at an individual level for students, then you need an incentive structure where customers have power. You as a voter have very, very little power over your public school system, almost none. And I know this because I don't have a great deal of power over the public education system. And I sit on the education committee for the Virginia House of Delegates. Arguably, arguably you would think that I have a tremendous amount of power, right? I get one vote on that committee. So when parent, when parents go to these school board meetings and, and raise their concerns or voice, are they, are they being effective at all? I mean, I know they should, but they, they should, but here's what I need people to understand about a government run school model, right? It's always going to have politics mm -hmm. and it is fundamentally going to be oriented toward the institution, not the customer, which is your child. And, and by proxy, you, mm -hmm. you, you are not the focus. You don't have the biggest lobby when you, when do, do I have 20,000 parents, uh, you know, showing up, you know, every time that we have an issue with a school, no, they might show up to the local school board. Okay. Let's say you change your local school board, right? That would be good. That would be a good positive change that can affect some of the stuff that's maybe shown up in your kid's school library, or maybe some of the policies with respect to boys and girls or boys competing in girls sports. Yeah, until your state legislator decides that that's going to be the policy across the board or until the federal government decides that you don't get your Title IX funding anymore if you don't incorporate this policy. And then let me tell you what's exactly, exactly what's going to happen. The Virginia Education Association for Virginia, and you have state chapters uh, for the National Education Association, the lawyers that they help provide for your local school board is going to go tell your school board members, hey, I know you don't like this policy, but it's going to cost you 9% of your overall budget if you don't incorporate it. And then people are going to be really mad at you and you're going to lose your election. Or you're going to get sued in court and you could lose not only Title IX funding, but you might be sued for damages as well. So the risk averse thing for you to do right now is just to go along with the policy and say it's out of your hands. Okay, great. So you you can so that's the that's the battle that you're up against. You are up against a fully funded with your tax dollars mm -hmm. lobbying entity, right? That is going to have far more power over your local legislature, far more power over your local school board than you ever will. Or you can pull your kit. 
I get that some people might not feel like they're in a financial position to be able to do it. Maybe they're not in a financial position to be able to do it. I'm not telling you what you should do for your child's education. There are people that successfully navigate the public school system and are happy with the results. Fine. I am telling you that if you have a problem with what's going on in this country, you don't get to ignore that it starts in your kid's public school. Yes, the nice local one that you have within your rural area, it starts there. So you're either going to be very, very involved and you're going to be pushing back against some of the narratives that are going to get to your kid through the curriculum or through other students or maybe through certain teachers or administrators. You're either going to push back against or you're going to pull them from the system. But if you just decide to outsource the education of your child to that government-run system, then I'm going to quote Vody Bauckham here. You don't get to send your kids to Caesar for their education and be shocked when they come home as Romans. Yeah. You don't get to send your kid to a government entity to educate your children and then be shocked when your kid comes home and believes that the government's responsible for essentially providing most things within their life, not just their education. Yeah. What, what are some of those options as, uh, as parents pull their kids, the, the ones that you do choose to pull their kids? There, there's, okay, so obviously there, there's private schools, and not all private schools are religious, but a lot of them are, right? Yeah. There's, there's private schools, there's parochial schools. There's uh, homeschool options have increased in a way that they've yeah. never existed before, and COVID is responsible for a lot of that. We sent our kids to public school for one year, uh, I think a year and a half, actually, for two of them. And then we pulled them out and we homeschooled them for all the rest. There are homeschool co-op uh, opportunities out there. They're very affordable. We, we both know, uh, you know, Matt Boudreaux and Tim Kennedy, they do their Apogee, Apogee, thing, Apogee yeah. program, which is another model uh, along with it. The biggest thing that I want parents to understand about homeschooling is that they look at it with a great deal of concern that they're never going to be able to replicate the public school model at home. And the answer to that is correct. You don't want to. The public school model is not designed for your children. The public school model is designed for mass production of education. One of the, one of the things that was so wonderful to my wife and I, and, and, and I, can, I could write a book about the mistakes we made in homeschooling. But one of the things that was so wonderful about it was not just the time that we got back with our kids and the wonderful relationship I have with all of my children. It was the fact that when they had problem with the subject matter, I didn't sit there and, and fill out requests for curriculum changes or different tutors. We changed the curriculum. We got him a tutor. We, we didn't have to ask permission. I didn't have to go to a school board meeting. I changed it. They got into high school. Okay, what do you want to do with your life? Because the first thing that we would tell our kids is, you got to feed yourself. Mm. Dreams are great. They just don't feed you. So you either got to pick a dream that allows you to feed yourself, or you got to pick a job that allows you to pursue your dreams but you got to feed yourself. That's on you. It's not the government's responsibility. It's not mom and dad's response. It's on you. It's part of being a responsible adult. Well, they got into high school and realized, why are we trying to give them all these courses that the public school would give them when it does nothing for them and what they're actually trying to achieve, you know, professionally. So we got to orient their curriculum toward what do you want to do? My son decided he wanted to go into the military. Great. We're going to talk about tactics. We're going to talk about ruck marching. We're going to talk about map reading. We're going to talk about this. Now, did that mean obviously all of our kids went through basic reading because you got to be literate no matter what you do. All of them went through basic mathematics because you got to understand mathematics no matter what you do, right? But did we take them through calculus or, or trigonometry so they could get a college prep degree if they didn't want to do anything that was, no, why would I do that? Right. Why would I force my kids to beat their head against the wall learning a subject they're never going to use again when I could spend Meanwhile, that time on something they are going to use? Meanwhile, they can't balance a checkbook or... or change a tire. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and not only that, but because we don't force them to, to consume subject matter, which we cannot reasonably provide an, an, a reason for, right. They don't see learning as some horrible thing that they have to do against their will. They don't see learning as a building that they go to where they just sit and engage in rote memorization or do standardized tests. They see learning as an opportunity to gain capabilities. Yeah capabilities that will have spiritual, intellectual, emotional, professional, and physical value. And so learning is not a bad thing. Learning is an opportunity. Can you manage that same sort of mindset through a public school system? Yes. But just understand that increasingly that, that mindset, especially if you're someone that's more conservative, especially if you're someone that's Christian, it is hostile to you. It's not a neutral party. It is hostile to you. Yeah. And all you have to do is take a look at some of the curriculum. All you have to do is take a look at some of the things they, they require your teachers to go through in order to get it into the classroom. 
All you have to do is take a look at your school library to understand yes. that that is what's going on. It is a hostile environment. It sucks that you got to subsidize it through your taxes, right? I carry legislation almost every year to try to get people their money back if they choose a different educational model. And each time I can, I can promise you the teachers union, the superintendents association, the school board association, which is largely just mm -hmm. national education association or American teachers federation, you know, they will all show up to oppose it. Well, that'll, that'll, that'll change the incentive structure. Right? Yes. And that would change the quality. Yes. Yeah. Because you'd have a customer at that point. Well, well, let me ask you this, right? <laughs> Let's say you are a kick ass teacher. You right. are good at what you do, man. You are good at what you do. Do you get paid more? No. The answer is no, <laughs> right? Seniority. Here's the, my favorite example ever. I actually use this on the vice mayor of, of Charlottesville, Virginia, which for those of you who don't know, Charlottesville, not exactly a bastion of conservative thought. <laughs> it's like our version of Portland, right? I looked at him and I said, I want you to imagine a system. I want you to imagine um, an, a very important commodity or service. Let's go with food, right? Without food, you starve. Arguably the most important thing out there other than oxygen, which is free anyway, yeah. right? Let's say that the government said, you know what? Food is critical to society. Literally without it, society dies. And, and we cannot trust the private sector to produce food. We, how can we leave this to greedy business people in, in order to, to come up with it? It's, it's, it's going to be horrible. So what we need to do as the government is we need to come up with a model where the government will now run farms and grocery stores. And the way it's going to work in the future is that you're going to pay your taxes to the government and the government's going to open up 10,000 government grocery stores. Now, you're not going to get to shop at whatever grocery store you want. You're going to be assigned a government grocery store based off of your zip code. Now, when you show up to the grocery store, you're not going to get to pick what food you want, right? No, that's going to be determined by experts. They're going to look at the positive caloric intake and the food pyramid given to us by the FDA, and they're going to decide for you what your groceries look like. Now, if you don't like the content of your groceries, no worries. You're just going to have to go through a multi-year process of lobbying your local food board or your state legislature or your federal legislature in order to change the contents of your groceries. But just keep in mind, when you show up to lobby them, everybody that currently has something in your grocery bag, all of those, they're going to come up and lobby against you in order to make sure that their products remain. By the way, none of the people working at this government grocery store will be rewarded based off of work ethic, ingenuity, any of those things. They will be rewarded exclusively based off of seniority within the system. Now, here's my question. Does that sound like a grocery store you would want to be subjected to? And the answer is always no. universally no. I'm just like, thank you. That's, that's exactly nice. what we did with the public school system. Yeah. The government sets up public school system. You don't get to choose which public school you go to. It's assigned to you based off of your zip code. When you show up, you have little to no say over any of the curriculum. And none of your teachers are rewarded based off of work ethic, ingenuity, or creativity. They're rewarded based off of seniority. So if you can understand what a monumentally stupid idea this would be in this other sector of the economy, which we all agree is even more important, mm -hmm. why, can we not, why can we not even explore alternatives where we are not all forced and required to pay into a system which has done such a horrible job of serving so many students. And the reason why you're not is because there are interests that are absolutely dedicated to the model which currently exists and don't want you to have options outside of it. Well, the, the thing that a lot of people don't want to admit is, is where we are. I don't know the number you may know, but where we are internationally ranked in, a, in the education system, we're not even successful. Well, and the interesting part is they'll come back and they'll, they'll <laughs> use Finland as an example. And so, well, Finland has a much better example because they pay their teachers more. So that's the problem. We don't pay our teachers enough. Well, first of all, Finland has a lot of things that they do very differently. One of the things they encourage a lot more of at early years is more play. Mm -hmm. So there's, their students are not as cooped, cooped up in classrooms as much. But the problem is, is that, I, look, say whatever you want about other systems. If it's government run, inevitably... Same problem. No matter how good it is right now, over time, it will get worse because the incentive structure is wrong. The incentive structure is not based on, on fulfilling the needs of customers and individuals. The system is based off of serving the system. Mm -hmm. And you will get people, we call it rent sinking. You will get people that either make a lot of money off the system as it currently exists or possess a lot of power based off of how the system currently exists. And they, they are not concerned they're not primarily concerned about your individual needs, wants, or desires as a customer, either as a parent or a student, right? It's always the greater good. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to hear something really unpopular? School systems don't exist for teachers. Hmm. That should be a very easy notion to grasp, right? <laughs> right. We didn't set up schools because teachers needed jobs. 
teachers have jobs because kids need to learn. But if you look at the arguments that we currently get made for our current system, it's like, why do you hate teachers? I don't hate teachers. I don't hate, I don't hate college professors. Those are just professions, right? They're, they're, they're morally neutral. They can be occupied by a good person or a bad person. Yeah. But in a system where customers must be satisfied, good teachers will get paid a lot more. Mm. Because if, if you're going to pick a school for your kids, right, and you're paying for it, are you picking the school with the with the best administrator? Are you are you picking the school with the most administrators or the most programs? Or, the, or are you picking the one that has the best teachers? Best teachers, yeah. And then now that teacher is in a position where they can go to that school that's paying them and say, look, students are coming here because I'm a good teacher. I want to be paid commiserate with that effort. Well, if they don't, that teacher leaves. And it's not like the students don't. Students don't. No, they follow, follow the, the teacher. teacher yeah. You, yeah. you look at the price per pupil in this country, like in Virginia, we're paying upwards of around twelve to $15,000 per student. You know, so if a teacher had 10 students, does that mean she's making, you know, 120 grand a year? No, because we have a bunch of infrastructure. We have a bunch of overhead. We have a bunch of other government. Okay, but is it serving us well? And if you're going to tell me the answer is just adopt this other government model or pay teachers more, I'm going to tell you, if you don't change the incentive structure, you haven't fundamentally got to the yeah. problem that we need to address. I want to shift to uh, our Second Amendment. Um, the Second Amendment is something I'm, you know, I'm a brand ambassador for Smith and Wesson Firearms, not because yeah. of anything other than I, I just I, I believe in people's ability as Americans to be able to defend themselves, mm -hmm. not to have firearms to hunt. Yeah, uh, I am a hunter. <laughs> I've been hunting yeah. since I was six years old, uh, yeah. growing up in Louisiana. But I, but I want to be able to defend myself, and uh, and my 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 right is to be able to defend yeah. myself. My Second Amendment right is to do that. And I think the argument against the Second Amendment is, is so disingenuous because the left seems to target uh, patriotic, pa like law-abiding patriots and not target the actual criminals in the inner cities that are actually committing yep. crimes with guns. And so it's just such a disingenuous argument to me. Uh, but why do you think it's just increasingly, increasingly uh, widespread amongst members of Congress to, to, to go after our Second Amendment? Okay, so I'll give the, um, I don't want to straw man argument at this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to steal man it. So I'm going to give them, I'm going to give the best representation of their argument I can come up with. Yeah. And that is when you look at um, the technological development of firearms, when you look at the rapid nature for which they can cause mass amount of damage in a relatively short period of time, when you look at how that damage has been wrought amongst the most innocent within society, clearly we need greater restrictions in order to prevent that from happening. The only other way we can do that is we have to go to the source of the tool that's actually being utilized to do it, right? That's right. There you go. That's that's yeah, what I would yeah, consider we, to be we a don't fair... Have mus we don't have muskets anymore. The Second Amendment was written when they had muskets. Right, right? Second Amendment was written to have muskets, right? There we go. <sighs> Here's the problem with that. That that's that's the that's the person that I believe is being genuine and then just doesn't understand the issue. There's another group of people that I will tell you right now that they want your guns because they recognize what private citizens having guns means. And that means that they can't tinker with society the way they would like to. Because the re and they focus on our democracy. Well, they got elected. They got elected to do things. And you, you, not being able, you being able to not comply with the things they want to do is you standing in the way of democracy, right? That's the far more nefarious approach to this. And I always say, those politicians, they don't dislike guns. They love guns. They just want to make sure that they control all of them. Right. Right, because there's no way they can make you do the things they want you to do without the guns. And it's a lot harder for them to make you do the things if you have guns too, right? So that's the more nefarious thing. And nobody gets to tell me that's not a thing because a, a quick perusal of the 20th century has demonstrated that there were a lot of powerful gov governments that really thought it was essential to take people's ability to defend themselves away from them and then did some pretty bad things to them. But let's, let's go with the first one, right? This is, yeah. the, this is the person that like, look, I don't know anything about guns. All I know is that school shootings are happening. I want it to stop. And I feel like if we just, if we did this, it would, it would stop it. Okay, let's talk about what it means to live in a free society. It means that there's trade-offs. Actually, there's trade-offs in just reality. Tom, sure, yeah. Thomas Sowell said this best. He goes, politicians like to talk about solutions when in reality what they're offering you is trade-offs. And a lot of times they're horrible trade-offs that never deliver on what the, the solution is that they told you they were going to give you. So if you tell me what I want to do is I want to ban a certain type of gun, let's say AR-15s. I want to ban AR-15s. No citizen needs an AR-15. Okay. Well, um, you, you've accounted for almost none of the gun deaths in the country, not to mention the fact that somebody could just as easily get something else and do the same thing. So sure. have you solved your problem? No. Okay, so then what are you going to do next? 
well, we're going to ban all these other guns that do the same thing I wanted. Okay, so you're going to ban all semi-automatic pistols. You're going to ban all semi-automatic rifles. Like, that's what you really want now, right? That's not what you told us when you got elected. Right. But now that's what you really want, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, now we're going to have to look at the overall gun use statistics within the United States because you like to talk about the 33,000 deaths, you know, two-thirds of which are suicides, which are, are very tragic. But I don't think you can reasonably say we should restrict your gun rights because somebody else used a firearm to kill themselves. When we look at the remaining third, now we're talking about homicides that took place usually as a result of gang violence within the inner cities. And then you have a whole host of other cases, which are a much smaller percentage. What they don't want to talk about is the 500,000 to 1.5 million use cases every year where somebody uses a firearm to prevent themselves from becoming a murder victim, a rape victim, a burglary victim, a theft victim, et cetera. So, which there, is why I want my second amendment right. right so right. there's your trade-off, right? Yeah. There's your trade-off. From, so from a criminal perspective, your trade-off is you are hoping that if you restrict my ability to own a gun, someone that has never committed a crime with a firearm, you are hoping that it will reduce the number of gun-related deaths on this side of the ledger. Which is about less than 10,000. Right? Well, 33,000. Oh, yeah, if you take out the, the suicide. Yeah. You're, you're hoping that's what will happen, okay? Yeah. But what I can guarantee will happen is that out of the 500 to 1.5 million use cases per year, this is according to like CDC numbers, so it's not a gun rights group that came up with this, these people will now be disarmed because they're going to follow the law. And so now when the drunk boyfriend comes over, he beats her to death. He doesn't get scared away by a gun. Now when the guy comes in and robs the liquor store, the guy gets robbed or hurt. He doesn't scare the guy away with a gun, you know, and so on and so forth. And are you going to bear any responsibility for the people that have now been hurt because you denied them their right to be able to defend themselves? And the answer is no. And the reason why you know that is because the way they look at gun statistics. If the drunk boyfriend shows up and beats her to death, that doesn't increase the gun-related homicide statistics. If the drunk boyfriend shows up, starts to beat her, and she shoots him and he dies, that negatively impacts the gun statistics. So here's the question. Is society better or worse off that she had a gun and shot that guy? I would argue it probably is. For sure. I would argue it probably is. Yeah. Right? But it it gets used in their use cases of, well, this is why we need more gun control. That was a gun homicide. Right? So stop talking about like imaginary solutions that don't exist. Yeah. And start talking about trade-offs. Because in the in the real world, you have to bear some if you deny somebody access to their right and they get hurt as a result of it, you bear responsibility for it. Now, if you protect somebody's right and they misuse it, you don't bear responsibility for that. They misuse their right. They now need to be punished for it. Because ultimately, if my ability to defend myself or any of my rights, any of my civil liberties, if those civil liberties are completely dependent on whether or not somebody else abuses theirs, then they're not rights anymore. They're simply privileges. Mm -hmm. And what you've done is create a perverse incentive. You want to take guns? Well, then if somebody shoots somebody, you now have moral justification to take my guns under that worldview because my rights no longer exist the moment somebody else abuses theirs. Right. Is that really the sort of society you want to live in? Because it's not a far jump from, well, I don't like, I think what you said causes violence. And so you don't get your freedom of speech anymore because you've used it in such a way that, that causes harm to others. You've abused it. You lost it. Right. And, er and, oh, no, everybody, no. and everybody loses you be, everybody loses it. Everybody you loses abused it. it, so that guy loses yeah. it. Right? That's the way that that's the way that we're conducting yeah. law now in a free society. Yeah. yeah, it's not a free society at that point. So and, and and that's just on the criminal side. There's a whole nother element to the Second Amendment. What do you think? I mean, I wanna ask I wanna ask you to be a conspiracist and join me in this conspiracy theory here. But what do you what do you think's the motivation behind it? And I and I, I wanna ask before you answer it. On the most nefarious end, right? yeah. Because I think when you look at what the motivation would be in the most nefarious end, that would that would be our biggest, like the biggest threat to us as yeah. as citizens. Sure. If I want to control a society, yeah, um, that society's ability to resist me is problematic, and so it has to be one of the first things that I isolate and do in order to ensure that whatever my edicts are, whatever my vision is for society can be effectively carried out. Because if you have the, if you have the ability to resist, then I, that's a problem for me. 
Now, I can't just come right out and say, hey, I really want to run your life for you. And that's why I'm going to take all your guns away so you can't resist me. I have to create a morally plausible condition in order to get you to hand over your guns. In fact, in order to get you to join me in trying to take other people's guns away. Mm -hmm. And so obviously a, a situation where innocent people, especially the most vulnerable and innocent among us, are being killed with the use of this firearm, I can make an easy argument to convince a significant portion of the population, especially those who are not familiar with guns, don't understand their necessity, don't live in any sort of like fear of crime or anything else. Well, of course I can convince those people that the solution to this and, and, and if you don't, and again, I'm never going to get into the details of how we actually do it. I'm never going to get into the details of what actually happens. I'm just going to create a binary choice where you either want to save kids' lives or you're a gun nut. Yeah. Right. And, right. and, and then I'm going to pound that through arts and entertainment, through, um, music, through TV shows, through after school specials. I'm really going to talk about it a lot to your children, right? Because if I can't convince you. Because they have government school. They if I can't that. convince you, I'm going to convince, I'm going to convince your kids. And they grandstand on every, on every tragedy. And, and we're going to do walkouts and I'm going to encourage them in those walkouts. And I'm going to ask them to write letters to congressmen talking about dealing with this problem, how they do it. And I'm going to create this constant narrative over and over and over again within your kids. So by the time that they're 18, 19, 20, not only do they not care about guns being taken away, they're actively participating in that process because they not only get, they're, they're not only, they're not just taking something away. They're, they're part of the moral solution for society to keep kids safe. You know, that's, that's an unassailable goal. Yeah. So that's what I do. And then over time, half of you, over half of you give your guns away. And then slowly I alienate the rest of you. And then you're forced to give them up. And then at that point, now I have a lot more leeway on what I can do or what I can't do. Because you can't resist. You certainly can't do it very effectively. Yeah. I, I, do, I do find it funny, too, that when you got people like Joe Biden saying things like, oh, you're going to stand up to the United States military? You think you can do that with small arms? I'm like, well, I just called the Taliban, and it turns out, yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 When, when guys like you are in charge, <laughs> yes, you, you yeah. absolutely can. Yeah. Um, the fact that he talked about F-16s with a, yeah. uh, versus American citizens. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and one, it just goes to show the mentality too, because increasingly when it comes to leaving billions of dollars worth of military equipment and giving them hundreds of millions of dollars and essentially bribes to the Taliban, yeah. that's fine. Sure. That's, that's, that's just what we got to do. That's the practical reality. But when it comes to bombing us citizens, if it means getting your guns, well, you're traitors anyways. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're, you're an oppressor. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's the, that's the most nefarious version I can dream yeah. up and and that's, all i did was explain what dictators have done yeah and anyway, we're seeing it here I, I mean that's that's exactly you know how i feel too and that's my concern and yeah. uh and uh you know that's the agenda that i see behind the curtain that's the agenda that i see them pushing yeah. and grandstanding on all these tragedies they, they are they're arresting people in in the uk right now mm -hmm. for saying mean things on twitter and praying silently outside of abortion clinics yeah right so this this idea in canada they were shutting down bank accounts yeah. for people. Uh, they did the same thing in the UK. So I, I'm not, I'm not just conjuring up images of Maoist China or Stalinist Russia. Right. These are in countries that we all consider to be relatively free and within that same tradition that, that our country comes from. And yet these things are going on. Go look at what the Australian police were doing to people in parks during the late latter end of COVID. Yeah. You talked about Canada, UK and Australia, all the countries in which they've lost their guns. Yeah. Yeah. 2024, it's election year. I, I can't, I can't do this episode with you without asking you yeah. your predictions for this insane, uh, insane situation we sure. ourselves in for the 2024 election. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm excited to see who the Party of Democracy picks to be their candidate after yeah. they, after they rig their own is, is primary there, elections to is ensure there that a dem democratic yeah. process and they skipped their primaries, right? Yeah. They, they skipped all the party of democracy, skipped all of those pesky democratic processes when it yeah. came to selecting their candidate. Um, I, I look, I, I, I am cautiously optimistic. Um, I look, I'm going to be voting for Trump Vance. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be a huge mistake for anybody that does plan to do that, to assume that this is in the bag. I will also say this, if you're someone that believes the 2020 election was stolen, I understand that. Mm. If you're someone that says, therefore, I'm not going to vote because what's the point? 
screw you, man. Yeah, get out and vote. Screw <laughs> you. Like, I, oh my gosh, that just pisses me off like nobody's business. I've heard business. people say this though, and I'm like, oh, what I have are you to. talking about? I have to, and I want to look at them and be like, you know what? You, you are worse than the other side. Yeah. You are absolutely frigging worse than the other side because at least they're out there fighting. I might not like what they're doing or how they're doing it, but the fact that you're not, you're going to say, what's the point? Well, what else do you plan to do about it then? Yeah. Other than bitch on Facebook, apologize my language, I, other than I, complain on Facebook, what do you plan to do? Yeah. And the answer is nothing because you don't want to win. You want to have an air of moral superiority. You want to stand on the ash heap of my country and say, told you so without doing a damn thing to make sure it doesn't happen. So, Ha, huh, sorry. Yeah, no. I, that just pisses me off. Like, I get it. I get how frustrated you are. Believe me, I have to sit for 60 days in the General Assembly session every other year, 45 during uh, odd years, and listen to colleagues on the other side of the aisle tell me I'm a racist, white supremacist, Nazi bigot, because I don't want them to take your guns. Right? And I do it. I do it, and then I get up, and I respond, and I fight back, and I go through that entire process because I believe that we've got to fight for it. And I will fight. I'll fight with, with anything I can. The other thing I see is I'll see some people like Nick, we're past that. It's just time to go to the shooting war. Like you ever been to one man? Yeah. You yeah. want your kids to see that? Yeah. We don't want that here. I don't want that here. I don't want that for my country. I don't want to hurt the people I disagree with politically. Yeah. I would like to convince them. And if I can't convince them, I'm happy to leave them alone as long as they're willing to do the same. But one thing I will not be is a subject. Mm -hmm. I'm not a subject. I'm a citizen. And so I have a, I have a process. I have a, I have a method to work for. Am I skeptical of how it's been run? Absolutely. But I will exhaust it. And what that means is I will get at it. And I will fight for the candidates that I want to win and I will donate and I will volunteer and I will vote and I will do all of those things. I will do that at the federal level. I will do that at the state level. I will do that at the local level. Mm -hmm. I will participate in the process. Should we ever come to a day where that process is legitimately no longer useful, well then, yeah, I'm not left with many options at that point because I'm not going to be a subject. But at this point, I do think, I do think we have a really good shot of winning this one this year. Yeah, I, I do believe there's going to be cheating, right? Uh, yeah. But I believe they would have to cheat so much that it would be unhideable. I agree. Uh, and uh, I just don't know that they could do that. I think the cheating this year would be so bad that it would break them. Yeah. I went from I went from someone that said, look, because here's the other argument I think I will make, and I think people need to hear me on this because they're immediately going to be like, no, if you don't believe that 2020 was stolen, then you're you're a shill or you're a hack or you're a cuck or whatever else they're calling us these days. Right. The left has effective control, maybe not legal control, but effective control of almost every single culturally shaping institution in this country, the schools, the universities. 70% of the news media, probably 80 to 90% of Hollywood. Do you think they have to cheat to win? Or do you think that they fought for so many culturally shaping institutions that they're at a point right now where people are actually voting it because they actually believe this nonsense? Mm -hmm. Now, here's my question. Are you sending your kid into that? Are you letting your kid having unfettered access to that by what they watch, what they listen to through their smartphone? If, if the answer is yes, if you're like, I'm not going to vote because they just steal it but you let your kid be raised by it. Yeah. You don't get to come back and tell me that cheating is the only way they can win, right? You got to fight for all of those institutions and on the institutions you can't fight for set up competing ones, right? If you, if you can't win over your local school district, get your kid out and set something up to compete, right? Do the hard work. And I think that's the problem with some of the, and the conservative movement is they think they should be able to solve it with a vote. Ladies and gentlemen, our side of this debate has never believed that because we've never believed that our government is the fundamental thing which defines the United States. We believe that the fundamental thing that is defined the United States are the ideas and the people. Getting to live your life and pursue happiness the way you want to, provided you don't infringe on the rights of others to do the same. But if you now want to seed all of that and say, well, it's all just about who's in the White House, yeah. They already won, man. They already won. If you honestly believe that who's in the white house matters, but it shouldn't be the only thing that matters. Right. That's yeah, so I've been everywhere. I've been speaking. I'm going to say this vote, vote, absolutely vote. But, but real change is going to start in your home. Oh yeah. It's I start in your home I, at, the, at your dinner table. That's I, where I had somebody, it was Lila Rose actually, um, from live action, huge person within the pro-life movement. And, um, she was asking about like, what can people do? 
And I said, look, like you, you got to vote. You got to participate, got to do these other things. I said, but our country is in the shape it's in because families are in the shape they're in. Yeah. I said, I will tell you this much. There are things that I can look back on. I was, ah, I was, what is it about your 40s and your kids get on older? It starts making you a whiny, cry little, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. I used to always be a tough guy, but certain stuff gets me choked up now. I have done certain things within my life that the secular world can look on and say, that was, that was a success. That was something meriting either accolades or admiration. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am proud of being a paratrooper. I'm proud of being a Green Beret. I'm proud of, I, I'm proud of being a, a, a representative in the House of Delegates, the longest continuously serving body in the Western Hemisphere. I'm proud that I represent James Madison's district in Virginia. I'm proud that, that our, our shows on YouTube and, and the things we do on Instagram have, have grown exponentially over the last couple of years. But the greatest impact I will have on this country and, and, and on my community will be found in whether or not I did what God commanded me to do as his child, as a husband to my wife, and as a father to my children. That will be my legacy, which far outlives anybody caring about whether or not I was a Green Beret or whether or not I was a, an elected representative. That will be the legacy. And I will watch people pour 80, 90% of the effort that they have into fights, which may be important, but can nowhere compare to the fight going on within their own house. Like if you are not putting the active measure that you need to be into what that marriage represents and the promise you made to her, right? And in raising your children in the way that they should go, then everything else you did, man, is going to pale in comparison and that is actually, that should be, I, I don't mean this to be like condemnation. I mean it to be encouraging. W- one, of the, one of the greatest moments for me is when I was in the midst of all of these political battles and just day in, day out, hours upon hours upon hours, and then recognizing ultimately that, that the biggest fight I had was spending some time with my kids and, and going in there and doing that because I enjoy it. I love my kids. I love the fact that my wife and I have raised little humans <laughs> that I now want to be friends with now that they're adults. I, I love the fact that they are, are, it's not, it's not mom and dad's faith. It's theirs. It's their relationship with Christ. I love the fact that they know what they believe and they know what they want to do and they seek out personal responsibility. I, I love that they do that. And I, and I look back on it. I'm like, man, long after everybody's forgotten all the other stuff, I'm going to get to sit here with my grandchildren, hopefully one day my great-grandchildren, I'm going to get to see this carry on. And if you, and if you put your priorities there, not, not to ignore everything else, but put your priorities there, it's not just going to be, it, you're almost going to feel selfish on, on how great it is that you get to have that experience and you get to enjoy it so much. But at the same time, you will be doing the things necessary to save the country that you love. Man, I had a closing question, but you answered it. There. My, my my question was, what could, what should people be doing? And and you just answered it perfectly. And uh-huh. and uh, I think nothing else needs to be said, man. Uh, I, I appreciate you so much, uh, guys. If you're not already following Nick, definitely follow him on Instagram uh, for like I said, a daily daily dose of uh, uh some morning coffee Comedy. and uh, some good good witty humor and just good truth. Yeah. And, uh, and then check out his podcast, uh, as well. Where can people find the podcast? I know uh, if you go on YouTube, if, you just, if Nick J Freitas, that's X YouTube yeah. rumble, like that's where we are across the board. Our, our podcast is called making the argument. We have another show called the Y minutes, uh, okay. that we do, but yeah, Nick J Freitas will take it all of it. We'll put, we'll put it in our show notes in, in the bottom Appreciate of this it. thread too. So man, great having you on brother. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next week, guys.